hello, and welcome to this week's edition of the Cincy Reformed podcast. This is uh, Pastor Zach here with you. Pastor Brandon was unable to join me this week for our recording. And so uh, this week, it'll be just me. Bear with me, please. We're going to be thinking about the uh, liturgical act of absolution. This is something that we do at uh, Westside Reformed Church, and it is, to some, a surprising thing to hear and maybe even a little bit uh, disconcerting, but we believe that this has a great biblical warrant and also warrant in church history, and so we think this is a very, very helpful and good practice, and so thought we would spend uh, this uh, episode thinking about what uh, absolution is and also what it is not. So just to begin by giving you a definition of absolution, this is from the Dictionary of Liturgy and Worship. It is, quote, a formal act of pronouncing the forgiveness of sins, end quote. We can speak to one another in private sessions, and I'll come to this later as well, but just speaking to one another as Christians and speaking the truth in love, we can reassure one another that we are forgiven in Christ, and that that is a good thing. But when we're talking about absolution, we're especially thinking about that formal act, that formal act that would be done then by a minister or by an elder. So let's begin to think about this first uh, biblically, since I'm sure that many of our listeners could be thinking, oh, this sounds and smells like a Roman Catholic practice. Well, let me reassure you that this is actually a very biblical practice, and this is something that was recovered and um, very much supported by the uh, Protestant reformers, but we'll get to that in a moment. Let's begin with the Bible first. Some Old Testament uh, precedent for this practice of absolution. Uh, a good place to start here is Leviticus 9 and 10. If you go to Leviticus 9 and 10, you begin to see the how the priests were um, operating with, within the uh, tabernacle and how God had appointed them to serve the nation of Israel. Now, there were two things that were done by the priests there in chapters 9 and 10 of Leviticus. On one hand, they were to make atonement toward God, and they would offer up animals as a type of Jesus Christ. And by offering up those animals, they were accomplishing that typological redemption. They were accomplishing a symbolic uh, redemption, and it was an offering toward God. Now, we do not believe that pastors in our day do anything toward God in that respect of, of accomplishing redemption or accomplishing atonement. That was fulfilled by Christ alone on the cross. That was that priestly service of the Old Testament toward God, And that is then fulfilled in the high priest, the only high priest, who is Jesus Christ. But we should not throw the baby out with the bathwater because we need to understand that those priests of the Old Testament, they also had a calling to serve as pastors as well, as ministers toward Israel. And so after they offered up those animals, what then did we see Aaron do? Well, after he accomplished that symbolic redemption through the offering of an animal, he then went out toward the people. He raised his hands and he declared to them the forgiveness of their sins and the benediction of God that was upon them. In other words, the sacrifice was the accomplishment of atonement. And then he declared the atonement to the people, which was, you could say, an application of the atonement that was just accomplished. And it is there that we begin to see that ministerial act of declaring, based upon the completed sacrifice of Christ, to declare to God's people his benediction, his absolution, that indeed that applies to them. So Leviticus 9 and 10 uh, help us to begin with this Old Testament uh, consideration. Another place where we could go is Psalm 24. In Psalm 24, you have what scholars refer to as a gate liturgy, where God's people would make pilgrimage to the temple, and then as they would come up to the temple gates, they would speak and ask this question, who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? 
and who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully, he will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Now, as you just heard, there was a question asked, then a response, and many, if not most, scholars believe that this was a call and response, a sort of a dialogue that would occur at the gate, a question being asked by a priest or a prophet, and then the answer of holiness being given by the people. Well, then that really created a dilemma then for the people of Israel, because they would then have to be those who have clean hands and pure hearts. And so before then it transitions into that, um, the great celebration of lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Scholars believe that before that transition is made, that the priest or the prophet who is leading that dialogue would actually then intercede for God's people, praying for them, confessing their sins, and then pronouncing absolution toward them. Well, now, am I just making this up or are scholars just making this up? Well, no, because if you were to turn to Jeremiah chapters 7 and 14, what you would find there is that Jeremiah was being instructed by God that based upon the failure of Israel to repent and the failure to truly humble themselves, God was instructing Jeremiah to no longer intercede for God's people at the gate and to tell them that God was was remembering their sins. In other words, he was not forgiving their sins, but he was remembering them and that destruction was truly coming upon Israel. So the very fact that Jeremiah had to be instructed not to intercede and not to declare absolution toward them, that implies for us that that was the ordinary practice as they would draw near to the gates of the temple. Again, reading back to the gate liturgy of Psalm 24, we see that Jeremiah was then instructed to stop that gate liturgy and to not let the people in with comfort and confidence before the Lord, because indeed destruction was going to fall upon them for their failure to repent and to trust in the good news of Jesus Christ. So that by way of some Old Testament precedent. But then when we get to the New Testament witness, we see that this comes to full flower. Not only do we read in 1 John 1 that those who confess their sins find forgiveness because of Jesus Christ, 1 John verses, uh, chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. But we also see that this receives a ministerial um, application toward God's people. So, for example, in John chapter 20, after Jesus is raised from the dead, and as he speaks to his apostles, he speaks to them and prepares them for Pentecost by saying, Peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Again, he's preparing them for Pentecost. And then in the very next verse, If you you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. And so, as Jesus is preparing his apostles, who are also ministers of the gospel for Pentecost, what is he placing there at the very heart of their mission? That upon receiving the Holy Spirit, they would go forth with that task of declaring absolution, to pronounce forgiveness towards some, but then also to withhold forgiveness from others. Another place that we could turn is to Matthew chapters 16 and 18. This is where the Lord Jesus entrusts the apostles with what are called the keys of the kingdom. And as you read about the use of the keys of the kingdom, they're being used to open the kingdom in order to administer the blessings of the kingdom, especially forgiveness, but also to close the kingdom 
toward those who fail to repent, which is an extension of church discipline. And so this idea of granting the keys of the kingdom to the apostles, who again are ministers, and who then by virtue of this, the fact that the, their apostolic churches then exercise those keys of the kingdom, we then begin to see how there is a, a real live connection that Christ has with his church, that they are to speak on his behalf and to act on his behalf and to pronounce according to scripture what Christ pronounces. He pronounces forgiveness to those who repent and believe And then the kingdom is closed or forgiveness is withheld from those who fail to repent and believe. This same sort of perspective is found in the New Testament when in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and 4, we read about how the apostles and their ministerial company, they're spoken of as ambassadors of reconciliation. And if we think about what an ambassador is and what an ambassador does, we're immediately taken to the world of international politics. That's probably the first place where many of our minds go. And so someone is sent overseas then with an official task, not like a citizen of that country. So for example, if you know, the president sent an ambassador overseas, that's different than a citizen of the United States going overseas. The citizen can say true things about his home country, But the ambassador speaks with authority to speak on behalf of the president and to make pronouncements on behalf of the president. And that is the nature of what's happening then as ministers of the gospel go forth as ambassadors of reconciliation. They speak on behalf of the king. They speak with authority. Unlike just a citizen of the kingdom, they are charged and appointed by way of ordination to speak with power and authority the word of Christ, who is seated in heaven. Now, this might be all well and good, but then we also need to ask the question, has the church understood scripture in this way before? Or is this some sort of novel practice? Well, if we go through church history, what we will see is that there are clear roots of this practice of absolution in the early church and in the medieval church. If you were to go into the early church and the patristics, you would see that there is there a very formal reinstatement of those who fell away from the faith. A a formal liturgical reinstatement to readmit someone who had fallen away. They were called the lapsed. But if they had a time of persecution and somebody fell away from the faith, well, then you would have a a time where the, um, the minister or bishop would readmit that person who had shown repentance and faith to readmit that person back into the communion of the church. That was a moment of absolution, you could say. They were no longer belonging to the world as those who were excommunicated, but rather they were readmitted and therefore welcomed back into the kingdom of Jesus Christ, into the church. This um, patristic practice of readmitting the lapsed Well, then that became um, a quote-unquote sacrament within the medieval church, a sacrament that they called penance. Now, of course, we in the Reformed and um, Protestant churches do not believe that penance was its own sacrament, but we believe that there was a kernel of truth that um, that was being recognized, but it was just wrongly called a sacrament. Within that sacrament, Private confession was made to a priest, and then a priest would then administer absolution to that one in private. That's an incorrect application of James chapter 5, because James 5 speaks about how we should confess our sins to one another. And if you were to go into that confessional, you did not hear the priest confessing his sins to that um, person that was on the other side of the confessional wall, but rather it was a one-way direction. In other words, James 5 was taught telling Christians that for our own spiritual good, we are encouraged to confess our sins to one another, to forgive one another, and to do that as simply as Christians. James 5 was not establishing a, a sacrament. But then the Reformers, as they saw this in the Scripture, 
And as they saw the patristic practice, which then became a sacrament in the medieval church, they decided to reform that practice back to the teaching of Scripture because, again, they were reformers. They were not revolutionaries. And so the very key place where our Protestant forefathers went with this was to then bring absolution into the public sphere. That in the service of worship, like with that Psalm 24 gate liturgy, that absolution was declared to the people of God after they had confessed their sins. They did not view absolution as its own sacrament, but rather if you were to go to Luther or to Calvin, they viewed it as a renewal of the sacrament of baptism. For after all, what is baptism about? But the washing of our sins. And so, as the washing of sins was pronounced yet again, then they viewed that as the renewal of the sacrament of baptism. If you were to go to the liturgical use of absolution, it was used as a response to the reading of the law and to the confession of sins. And there were times as well where then scriptural sentences of gospel comfort were read prior to the absolution. And even in some places, you'd find the use of the creed like we do. We read the law and confess our sins in our church. We hear scriptural sentences of comfort, and we confess the creed. And then that conditional declaration of absolution is made, is a conditional declaration, conditioned upon repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. This means that the minister is not standing as the ultimate authority. He's not the master of absolution but rather he stands as a servant of God's word and as a servant of Christ and declares what Christ declares, declares what scripture declares. It should be noted here that when we then think about the practice of a minister declaring the absolution of sins, that this is really just an extension of preaching. It's, it is an extension of the word of God. When we think about the doctrine of preaching, we believe that the minister is speaking on behalf of Christ as he proclaims truly the words of Holy Scripture. And therefore, when we think about absolution, we are thinking about it as an extension of preaching, as an extension of baptism, whereby the gospel is being applied in a focused way to apply the atonements that Christ accomplished 2,000 years ago upon the cross to apply that in a focused way to the congregation standing before him in order that we never leave behind the condemnation of the law that threatens us according to our fallen nature and the need to be forgiven of our sins day after day, week after week, that we might be renewed in that great blessing that we are washed because of our sacrifice in Christ and our advocates and intercessor who is even now in heaven. And so this is a very good and helpful practice because it keeps the law and the gospel central to God's people, warning the proud and comforting the humble and those who might even be doubting whether God could ever forgive them because of their great sin that they committed this past week. The absolution declares that forgiveness is always found in Christ alone, Now, let me provide a couple of helpful quotes. Uh, First from John Calvin. He says this, For when the whole church stands, as it were, before God's judgment seat, confesses itself guilty, and has its sole refuge in God's mercy, it is a weighty thing to have present there the ambassador of Christ, armed with the mandate of reconciliation, by whom it hears proclaimed its absolution. It is a very weighty thing. Uh, Martin Bootser, who was, you could say, John Calvin's liturgical mentor, this is the absolution that he had in his liturgy after the confession of sins. Bootser and the other ministers of Strasbourg would say this, This is a weighty, a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, 
Let everyone with St. Paul truly acknowledge this in his heart and believe in Christ. Thus, in his name, I proclaim unto you the forgiveness of all your sins and declare you to be loosed of them on earth, that you be loosed of them in heaven, in eternity. Amen. You can hear there echoes of Scripture. Of course, the direct quote of 1 Timothy 1.15, but then also that language from the keys of the kingdom of being binding and loosing from Matthew chapters 16 and 12. <clears throat> there are a couple of other places where we can then see extension of absolution within the Protestant and uh, Reformed Church. You see this within the practices of um, ecclesiastical discipline and restoration. So, for example, the inverse of absolution it occurs when someone is excommunicated or even suspended from the Lord's table, that the kingdom is being closed and the blessings are being withheld. However, absolution is then granted toward, the, toward those who have been lapsed when someone returns to the church repenting and trusting in Jesus Christ, and then the kingdom is formally opened back to them as well. So, for example, we in our church have a liturgical form for readmission. If someone is excommunicated, then there's also a liturgical form to use for their readmission, that they then stand before the church to hear the absolution of their sins, and that everyone else around hears that as well, that they then be embraced as a brother or sister in Christ once again. Not only are there public uses of absolution, but they're also private as well. A pastor or an elder can do that um, in private. If the public absolution is not bearing the fruit of comfort, then perhaps it could be helpful for you, Christian, to go to your pastor and or go to an elder of your church, just simply to, to hear that privately directed to you personally by name. That is an appropriate practice, but it is not to be coerced. You do not have to go to your pastor or to an elder and confess all of your private sins to him as is coerced in the sacrament of penance, but rather this is to be an opportunity that can be done in freedom. You're free to approach your pastor or elder to then hear that private absolution to you personally if you are struggling to find comfort in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Likewise, we can extend this further to having private absolution from Christian to Christian. We see this in Matthew 18, don't we? If we sin against one another, well, what do we do? We forgive each other. We, in other words, grant absolution from one person to another to say, I absolve you. I forgive you. I no longer hold wrath against you. But then we can also, as Christians, one toward another, reassure and console a brother or sister who is struggling in sin and struggling to find comfort in the Lord Jesus Christ. We, of course, need only, we should only reassure and console one who has a posture of humility. And we do not absolve each other as one Christian to another in the same way that our pastor or an elder would do that, but rather, instead of speaking with authority as ordination confers, rather we speak the truth with love, directing one another always to Jesus Christ, who alone has accomplished the forgiveness and atonement of all our sins, that we then speak to one another to encourage one another until the day of Jesus Christ. Let me finish with reading here um, some verses that I've mentioned a few times now, but bear um, reading directly. This is from 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. And so, when we then therefore think in conclusion about this liturgical act of pronouncing absolution of sins, we are thinking about bringing the truth of 1 John 1 verse 9 to visible and liturgical and formal expression within the church of Jesus Christ, in order that we may never leave behind the reality of our sin, and the great glories and benefit of finding forgiveness in our Savior. I hope that um, this uh, reflection and consideration today has been a help to you.
You can find our other episodes at uh, cincyreformed.org. We are sponsored by westsidereformed.org. Come check us out. We're a URC Church, United Reformed Church in Cincinnati's West Side. We'd love to have you visit with us and to hear the absolution of your sins as you confess your sins and trust in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation. And we'd love you if you reach out to us if you have any questions about this topic or any other topic, or even if you have ideas of something that we could cover within our podcast, we would love to hear from you. And so until next time, and hopefully we'll have Pastor Brandon back with us as well, this is the Sincere Reform Podcast. Thanks so much for joining us. Bye-bye.